you very much for, for joining me. Uh, when this threat was made, we obviously heard a lot about it. Uh, what's 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 behind this? Is it is it tough talking pre-election stuff, um, saber rattling that we've come to use, or should we take it seriously? Should we be worried? Well, ever since the conflict really began, particularly after the in and around the invasion of Ukraine um, uh, in February 2022, the nuclear element has come up and there is no doubt about it that Putin thinks of this because it's part of his his his, his offer as a big powerful imperial uh, czarist figure this is what he is recreating um modeled partly on the czars partly on stalin is a new imperium of 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 russia um now down to the practicalities the tactical pr pr practicalities and chris will probably be better informed about this it's very very difficult indeed to see the circumstances in which you could use um uh, medium range or even tactical weapons and on the longer range stuff he's got china breathing down his neck and they really do not want putin mucking around with intercontinental nuclear warfare at, at, at all so there is something in it. There is a, some real political thought behind it. And by the way, with the election, we have to watch or listen very carefully as to what he's going to say afterwards, because I think he may be going to say an awful lot, which is going to put us on our metal. But this is setting out his stall. I'm big and tough. Don't blow the house down. Um, but we're doing OK. That's the other message. We're doing OK after some setbacks um, in Ukraine, although I must say I, I find it very difficult to uh, conceive of Bakhmut and then now Avdivka, which uh, the Ukrainians have given up as huge uh, strategic victories. No, they are, they are in some ways unnecessary and very, very bloody battles for both sides. Uh, t tell me, just uh, thinking the, the, the sort of behaviour through uh, I I in his message to people, we know he's always been very machismo. He's always, you know, I think we've had in the past, he's ridden horses semi-naked to show off his chest and all, all this sort of stuff. But um, what I kind of found interesting in all of this was uh, it seemed to be a case of um, I want to alarm and continue to divide opinion in Europe uh, over how you deal with me? Because I know there are divisions already. Is this meant to cause problems at home? Does he envisage that we'll all be out on the streets protesting about and demanding peace or something? Well, he's got a very useful friend, I won't say useful idiot, but the old Marxist terminology, in Viktor Orban, mm. and he has got elements of the really hard over, I don't like saying hard right or extreme right, but really hard over right nationalist, isolationist uh, element, things like the alternative for Deutschland. And there is no doubt about it that there is a big effort, there's a big overt and covert effort through Europe to get these stirred up to demonstrate. Very interestingly, he's not being very successful in uh, instrumentalizing protests over Gaza towards mm. the Russian cause. And Russia, in, to some extent, is caught over the Israel-Gaza crisis. But you're quite right. He's saying a split. You see, that it's meat and drink to him that you have the Pope saying what he did in the Swiss radio. Uh, Just remind us where, what that was. Well, it, it was a very strange interview. And somebody formally as politically astute as the pope saying oh it's time to raise the white flag thinking only that just means a signal that i'm prepared to talk he no nonsense uh, francis knows exactly what he's talking about he 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 survived the very nasty dictatorship in in argentina and it reminded me of the famous thing of stalin in the war how many divisions has the pope when the Pope was was uh, was I I intervening or not in World World War Two, um, the thing that went wrong, and I'd be again interested in Chris's view on the, on this. I think was the Tucker Carlson interview. Yeah. The Tucker Carlson interview turned out to be pantomime, and Putin knew it. He knew it immediately. He came off air. He was he was very very 
dismayed with Carlson. He was angry, but beyond angry, he was dismayed at how lightweight, how, how groveling. And he said, you didn't ask me any qu hard questions. And he wanted to be asked hard questions because he was going to lay out his store for his diplomatic track. So, He's still got a diplomatic track, you, uh, you, you, uh, you see. But I think that we're going to have the, the strategy the strategy for now you see me, now you don't, for Ukraine, but also the disruption from the Arctic through to the Gulf will come after this election. Uh, listen, Robert, thank you very much. You kept mentioning Chris there. I should explain. We've got um, uh, Rear Admiral Chris Parry joining us soon uh, to pick up on those points. Thanks so much for setting out what is going on and the thoughts behind that. It's Robert Fox, Defence Editor at the Evening Standard. Uh, and we'll be going to Chris in a minute to talk, talk about that. I think it's quite interesting what he said about the Tucker Carlson interview. He obviously knew he had a bit of a patsy journalist there, uh, but obviously wanted to be grilled harder. Uh, and it might very well have meant we would have even heard of this nuclear threat then during that what has become rather um, ridiculous interview that was carried out by Tucker Carlson. Uh, so uh, I'll explore that. But I also want to explore, as he suggested, um, Putin was suggesting that, and I think he used these words. It's quite interesting. He said, we have made much more progress here with our nuclear arsenal. It's more modern, either implying he didn't think it would work or they could use it effectively in the past. The question remains, you know, how formidable is he at the moment? So uh, for my mind, uh, already a couple of texts coming in on this. Tony in Liverpool says, Nick, Russia Russia is clearly winning and NATO has run out of weapons and munitions. This is the reality. It's a point I'll put to uh, Chris, Chris Parry, who were, um, I think is now ready to join us. Uh, so, ah, OK, no, my screen is not telling me the truth. Um, so uh, Chris isn't quite with us. Let's take uh, Anne in Hertfordshire and then hopefully we'll be able to speak to Chris. Anne, hello. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Thank you for holding on. You'd like to talk MPs' pay? Yeah, I want to talk about the MPs' pay. I I just find it astounding that we're in a cost-of-living crisis and people are struggling to pay their bills, like myself, I'm a pensioner, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm paying my bills, but it's a struggle, but I'll get there eventually. But they're rewarding themselves for failure. I think it's absolutely disgusting. Listen, How dare they do that? I'm going to do a favour. I'm going to leave you with a thought and we're going to go back to you because my next guest we've managed to connect with now. So my sincerest apologies, we will call you. Okay. But I just want to leave you okay. this one thought because the MP's pay rise was 57 but actually, pensioners, yep. 65, 66 years old and above, they had 8.5%. So let's discuss that yep. because I think that's a good talking point. Now, I'm very pleased to say we've got um, uh, Rear Admiral Chris Parry on the line. Chris, good to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. Sorry about those difficulties. You are with us. Um, uh, but a point put forward, actually, in my chat there with uh, Robert Fox, a uh, defence uh, editor, as you well know, from the Evening Standard. He was saying, actually, regardless of the threat of Putin talking about nuclear war, uh, the feasibility of even carrying out strikes is actually not as straightforward. What did he mean by that? Well, I think, uh, obviously, you, you can't talk about nuclear weapons without discussing what the likely impact zones are. But if Putin were to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, most of the fallout, as we saw with Chernobyl, would drift into Russia. Um, so it would be a serious own goal uh, and shooting himself in the foot. Um, so I think that's what he was referring to. But yeah. I think we, we have to consider that what is going on here is a lot of posturing around the time of the Russian election. He's trying to big himself and his country up. Uh, you know, the, the war in Ukraine is on the edge at the moment. Uh, and so every time he gets into trouble, Putin starts flourishing the nuclear sabre. Uh, and that's what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, he knows that... Uh, we have sufficient deterrent systems in the free world to say to him, look, whatever you think you're going to gain by using nuclear weapons, uh, we can actually do a lot of damage to you. In fact, probably terminal damage to your regime and all the um, settled parts of your country. He was saying in response, his, his threat came out when he linked it to the idea that if the US sent troops to UK, it would be seen as a, cons a, a significant escalation. What is the likelihood uh, of the US 
or anyone sending troops to Ukraine, which I presume would be in a combat situation. Well, I think it's no secret that uh, US troops, our own troops, and uh, quite a lot of other European uh, troops are supporting the Ukrainian war from a distance. There's no question about that. Um, we're already doing that. Uh, I think uh, what he's doing is trying to demarcate the dispute to keep uh, it's a Russia against Ukraine uh, war rather than bringing in any other people. Um, he's also doing it for the internal, uh, the internal population in Russia as well. He's trying to generate this idea that NATO's a threat. There isn't much chance of uh, direct combat being undertaken by NATO troops uh, in Ukraine. However, having said that, uh, quite a number of senior figures in the regime, Medvedev and others, Petrushev, are saying, well, actually, um, we rather fancy the Baltic republics and we don't like Sweden and Finland very much. Well, these are members of NATO. Uh, and so he's sort of provoking a, a sort of NATO reaction. But as I said, it's all part of the internal propaganda that keeps his people on side in a very testing time. Tony uh, from Liverpool put a question that I think he'd like me to put to you. Uh, is that uh, his assessment is Russia is clearly winning and NATO is running out of weapons and munitions. That's the reality. I Perhaps I'd sort of say the, 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 the U European will uh, is a divided and seems split at times. But is, is this in stalemate if, if not, um, and if no side is winning? Or are Russia definitely with the upper hand at the moment? No, Russia hasn't got the upper hand. Um, we'd be seeing a lot more sort of progress on the ground. What they are doing is consolidating within the territories that they do hold. They're murdering people. Uh, they're, they're obviously moving things around uh, in terms of their military uh, and logistic preparations. But there's no sign of a huge counteroffensive against the Ukrainians at the moment. You're absolutely right, Nick. What we're looking at is a North Korea, South Korea stalemate, I think, for many years to come now. Uh, and I think all the indications are uh, that the Russians will continue to uh, purge uh, those provinces that they hold. Uh, they'll, they'll try and get hold of Odessa, I reckon, uh, and complete the isolation of Ukraine from the Black Sea. Uh, those are their aims right now. I don't think they have uh, really the power, fighting power, or indeed the political intention of trying to uh, invade the rest of Ukraine. And uh, for all the noise that we hear coming out of Washington, uh, which has obviously fumbled the ball when it comes to financial aid with what's been going on in, in, in Congress, um, do, 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 do you put much stock by what uh, former president and quite possibly next president Trump says, either when he claims he could solve the war in one day or by the fact that he th seems to think withdrawal and making it a non-America issue are things we should take seriously. It does sound like leaders in Europe are preparing for that. No, this is, uh, if you read his book, and I'm sure you have, Nick, um, you know, uh, uh, about business, he says, what I do is I show you something with my left hand uh, and then I hit you with my right. And this is a classic indication really for everybody, including Putin and the rest of us in Europe, that if we don't actually start paying attention uh, to America's role in the world uh, and its ability to influence events, um, then he'll do something dramatic. But it won't be that. America needs the free world as much as the free world needs America right now. So I don't anticipate anything he's saying in this regard. Uh, will have any credence or valency the other side of the election if he comes into power.